picking up where we left off. Things are going so great. Hello. Things are going so great in the economy right now that it is like you're turning on a faucet and money is just coming out. It's just crazy amount of money in the market right now. You want a job? Go get a job. You want a second job? Go get a second job. Things are going fantastic. Oh, but here's the problem. Government, thinks, since things are going so well, government is very sympathetic to big business. They're saying, hey, Federal Trade Commission, who cares? International, uh, Interstate Commerce Commission, who cares? If everybody's happy and they're making money, then they're doing great. Don't even worry about that stuff. Era is known as welfare capitalism because there's so much money available that hours are, that workers are going to be required to work are going down at the same time that wages are going up. So they're working less, but they get paid more. Good deal. As a result, unions are not going to have any traction. You know, uh, you, why are you going to join a union if there's nothing wrong at work? Huh? You're not going to because, hey, things are great. Things are great for us. I don't need to pay money for a union. I pay money for a union because of this. I'm making more money than I've ever made. I'm working less hours. My wife's a uh, Grandfather always gives me a hard time. He says I work bases out. They know I work less than that. So I'm in class two times a week for a total of six hours. That's it. 40 hour week? I don't think so. A six hour week. If you guys don't listen to what I say, what happens? Fill your exam. Life doesn't get better than this. I'm joking. I'm joking. Somewhat I'm joking. No, really joking. So things are so great that it's not even necessary for you to do things too. But things aren't necessarily so great overseas. You know, we had gone over we gone to war. We, when we got over there, we we, uh, we believed that we fixed everything. We went over there, we fixed the problem, and it's done. Yay, things are great. We went over there, we ended the war. Now, don't mess up again, and we'll be cool. Kind of how we looked at it. Now, years later, after World War I is over, and we had you know, fixed it, You've got this problem coming back that you're seeing all these issues that are starting to rear their ugly head. And it's not making us very happy. We're disillusioned. You see, the war is over, but nothing has changed in the long run. Germans still hate French. The French still hate the Germans. And Russia, oh my gosh, that's a different situation. Entirely. But it really hasn't changed things. The Allies, remember, we gave them all of these loans. We gave them $5 billion in loans. So here's $5 billion to fight the war. Where are they going to buy things from with this $5 billion? Buy from us. Okay? Here's $5 billion for you to buy stuff from. Why do, why do car dealerships or, or car manufacturers say $10,000 rebate on this truck? Why do they want give you a $10,000 rebate on that truck. So you'll buy it. Okay. Give them $5 billion and say, here, buy stuff. But buy stuff from us. War is over. Say, okay, gave you $5 billion we want you to repay your loan. Problem is, they're broke. They can't pay us back. They were hoping to get a huge reparation from Germany so Germany could pay them <laughs> And when Germany paid them their reparations, then they could pay us back our our loan. Guess what? Ger Germany, the economy is so bad, they can't even pay their loan, their reparations. So what do they do? I hope none of you have done 
this, but I had a student tell me once they took out a credit card to pay off the debt of their other credit card. Okay? Is that helping anything? Just making it worse. Germany comes to us and says, hey, we need a loan. We need a loan so we can pay back France and England. To which somebody in the United States says, hey, that sounds like a great idea. Here you go. So they get the money from us. They give it to Germany. Germany gets the money from us. They give it to France. France then in turn tries to build up their own infrastructure, jumpstart their own economy so that they can pay us back. And they're not doing that. We're not too happy. And in addition, three empires that had existed previously no longer exist with all, everything that entails. Austria has been divided up. Germany has been beat, bloody. And the Ottoman Empire has uh, stopped existing. Now, the Ottoman Empire really, of the three, is the least harmful uh, at the time period, although... Uh, it is going to grow increasingly important as we get into the 60s, 70s, 80s, because the Ottoman Empire stretched from Turkey down to Syria, Palestine, a little place called non existence anymore, called Israel, uh, and then into, uh, into Libya and Algeria and Egypt. Now, granted, it was nominal people, but at least they still had some. So why is that important? What is what is that area known as today? I can tell you three words that it's called. What is it today? The Middle East. Okay. Oh my God. Okay. Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, Syria. Sound familiar? Yes. A lot of problems. Now this picture was published in 19. 19- the 1920s, and it's called, it's entitled, Better Keep to the Old Channel. What is this? Tell me what this is. It's the Titanic. It's the Titanic, and the Titanic, we all know, hit iceberg. Okay, when it hit iceberg, it sank. Okay? Now, that occurred in 19, what, 12? So in 1920, that is as relatable to for the American public. <laughs> that is as relatable to the American public as me to say September 11th is to you. You know September 11th. Yes? Okay? The Titanic is a tragic disaster. 9-11 was a tragic disaster. Here, this isn't Titanic, this is the United States sailing into troubled water. In this area, you have foreign treaty, you have foreign entanglement treaty with France and England and League of, the League of Nations that are all major icebergs in the path of the United States. The caption says, better keep to the old channel. The old channel would have been the whole isolation. Whereas that's not something we're involved in. You guys have your stuff over in Europe. We have our stuff over in the Americas. And we don't get involved in your stuff. You don't get involved in ours. That's how it's always been like it. But now the United States is sailing through the same area that the Titanic sailed through. And here there are all these icebergs in the past. So it's a cautionary tale to say, hey, no, let's not. Let's not do that. Our best bet is to stay isolation. Now, more fallout from the uh, Versailles uh, Treaty is that, bless you, is that the uh, Bolshevik Revolution is going to turn in, and they are going to start slaughtering their own people. You have this happen all the time. Whenever there's a revolution occur, there's someone who's a little bit more revolutionary than the revolutionary. And that person must be killed because... If you follow that crazy revolutionary, revolutionary revolutionist, you know, the one really far crazy person, they are going to, that if you follow them, their path is going to get rid of the guys in power now. They don't want that. So the Bolshevik revolution is going to turn inward amongst itself, and they're going to slaughter a vast percentage of their, of, of their people. Well, Political capital, yes. So no, it's no, correct. Because uh, especially scholars get going to uh, kill anybody that thinks like uh, anybody that doesn't think like any out of the box people he has assassinated. Anybody 
not a good idea to be still. He would go so far, Stalin goes so far, as that if he was in, there's a picture of that person in existence, him, he would have that person airbrushed out of the, the picture. There are pictures where you go in and you see one of the big guys that Stalin fought, fought with, a guy by the name Leon Trotsky. And uh, Trotsky would eventually be assassinated in Mexico. The, a, uh, and like a, not, not like a ice pick, but like how to take you use for uh, uh, climbing Mount Ice, which Mexico, why would there be one there? He's assassinated one. But what happens after he falls out, Stalin, Stalin find, has somebody find every single picture that has him in it, and they either crop him out of the picture or they airbrush him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Coming in through customs. Hey, uh, what are you doing? got this ice. Well, I'm going to do some ice climbing in the mountains of Mexico. Oh, yeah, we have a lot of ice. Mexico. Yeah. Okay, so. Britain is no longer the global leader. They have lost their status as the number one uh, global powerhouse. As a result, who steps in? The United States. France had been a first-rate country, but because of the amount of loss of life they experienced and the destruction done to their economy, they become a second-rate country. Now, we talked a little bit about him. Uh, we talked about General Eric Ludendorff from Germany, the guy that was basically the leader at the very end. When he realized the war was lost, he would start destroying the uh, the silver mine and the chief economic resource, uh, natural resources of France as they pulled back. They would say, okay, these silver mines need to be destroyed, this needs to be destroyed, to try to tamp France belt out for hope. And Italy is going to ignore the rest of the world. They're just going to become <laughs> almost like a, a pond where nothing gets in. Their, their economy is going to crash, uh, and then they are going to be rebuilt from the ground up as a fascist state. F-A-S-C-I-S-T, fascist. And this man right here is Benito Mussolini. Uh, Benito uh, Mussolini is also known as uh, El Duce, which is uh, the Duke. He was brighter. He, uh, Quite read the stuff, but he was uh, eventually able to parlay the economic turmoil in Italy into a party that built this fascist party and then was asked by the king of Italy to become prime minister. Now, uh, fascism is different from communism, the fact that communism, uh, the government controls everything, but they own everything. Now, communism. <laughs> Apparently, theoretically, under communism, there comes a point where government is no longer needed and it's just no such Christian. Now, every time communism tries to say, okay, I'm laying the groundwork for the Cold War to understand that communism is happening. Okay? Fascism is different. A lot of times people think that, that communism is over here on the political spectrum and fascism is here. And then we have Democrats, moderates, and Republicans. Okay? So communism would be on the left side, but it's really not that way. It's kind of hard to describe, but it's more like a horseshoe. Communists here and fascists here, and uh, moderates here, Democrats here, well, kind of at the top of it. But communism and fascism are really close together. The only difference is, is that under fascism, people still, uh, people still, retain ownership of their businesses. It's just that the government says this is what, this is the quota you're going to do. This right? You're going to produce this level of work. And if you don't, there will be rep uh, there will be, uh, repercussions. Now, of all the nations that fought in World War One, there's only one that is happy with the way things went at the, at the 
for either side. That is Japan. Japan lost around 300 men in the entire World War. But they come out the best of all the nations. Prior to World War I, their navy was a very, very small navy. You didn't even really hear me talk about Japan during World War I. But after the war, because of the loss of, of ships that Britain experienced, France experienced, Germany experienced, uh, and the United States had, Germany, uh, Japan emerges as the third largest fleet in the world. And for a nation that has to import, an island nation that has to import all its natural resources for their industrial uh, economy, a big navy is important. They had been in Korea since the turn of the 20th century, and they were slowly moving inward. <coughs> into Manchuria, which was a province of China. Now, obviously, the aggressive behavior of Japan following World War I is going to cause some concern for the rest of them. England had signed a treaty with Japan back in 1902 called the Anglo-Japanese Treaty that stated that because England and Japan were friends, Japan would provide protection for all of England's uh, colonies in the uh, Pacific Rim. Okay? That freed up England from having to worry about having a fleet over there. So England didn't have a fleet in, in the Pacific. If the United States and England had the largest fleets in the world, the United States was divided between uh, the Pacific and the Atlantic. England was in the Atlantic. For England to go into the Pacific, it could be seen as a breach of the Anglo-Japanese too. But they are concerned, England is concerned with the way Japan is acting. So they, as they usually do, approach the United States and says, hey, Will you, as a third party, sponsor a conference on naval armament? The United States says, yes, that is a great idea, because one of the reasons that we have this war one, general thinking is at this time, this naval arms race we got into. Remember the dreadnoughts? England had this, and then Germany said, for every three ships that England has, we're going to have two. So England says, whoa, we're going to have to get more than that, and then of course, because they get more ships, so does Germany, and then France jumps in there too. So what happened is, in 1921, last 1922, a conference is held uh, with nine powers, nine different nations, we'll talk all about in just a minute, but it, uh, at in, in Washington to discuss limiting naval weaponry. And the result of this conference was three treaties. The first one and the most important one is the five powers, and it establishes this ratio of five to five to three, 1.75 to 1.7. And what that means is for every five ships that England has, the United States will have five ships. For every five ships that England and the United States have, Japan would have three ships. For every three ships that the United, uh, excuse me, that Japan has, Italy and France would have 1.75. Now I know what you're saying. How the heck can you have 1.75 ships? Okay. It all deals with tonnage, the size of the ship. So if you have a uh, ship that is 500,000 tons, and you are England, Japan can have a 300,000 ton ship. Okay. to which uh, <laughs> Italy could have a 175,000-ton ship. It's all about the size of the ship. And limited. Now, when it comes down to it, we're only really concerned about these. Okay. Those are the 
the ones we're concerned about. These guys don't really care. Okay? They're kind of like the guys that want, like, you guys are going to all go out tonight, this Thursday, you're going to go wherever, I don't know, I don't want to know. And, 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 uh, you know, you call up your buddies, and you got your little group of buddies, then there's always that other guy. <laughs> okay? And you know, you know what I'm talking about, you know? You know? And I have to be careful because I usually use an analogy of, you know, my, my, my son likes to go out, you know, if he wanted to go out with somebody, you know, he'd go out with this guy, this guy, this guy. But there's always this other guy who nobody wants to go out with, and I can't say because Abby's in here and she knows exactly what I'm talking about. And so what happens is, you know, they're like, hey, I want to go too. Exactly. All right. So you <laughs> just back it up. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Okay. So we're not going to go there. I'm probably being read. So here's what happens. Here's what happens. See, my stories are my life. Unfortunately, I get to that age where just my kids, so my kids are going to have to happens. <laughs> so anyway, they're like, hey, I want to go too. Well, that's Italy and France. We're not concerned about them. Who cares? Italy and France, you're Italy and France. Who cares? No. Japan is the word. Japan is the word. <laughs> So what happens is that that okay, that's the reason that it was called. That was the reason the convention was called. However, the real reason that it was called was so that England and Japan could get out of this arrangement, get out of this alliance. And they replace it. The four power treaty is going to you know, result in the Anglo Japanese Alliance of nine two, which says that Japan's not responsible. Only uh, England, uh, England's colonies anymore. Okay, it's all 1920. The Anglo, no, replaced the Anglo-Japanese alliance. Okay. It's all part of it. Okay, four power treaty, but it has with basically what happens. Is what you need to know about this basically is this is being this is yet another mark on your list of the reason Japan is. Needing uh, Japan sees as reason to uh, attack the United States. Okay, they're saying the United States is getting in our business. We don't like that. Final kicker from the Washington Conference is the Nine Power Treaty, and the Nine Power Treaty is going to say that all the signatures, <laughs> that the signatories, all the signatures, uh, people signing it, are going to uh, are going to agree to respect the open door in China. Don't worry about these people. I just want to let you have an idea of who are the big players in this game. The the uh, players are United States, Japan, China, France, Great Britain, Italy, Belgium, Netherlands, Portugal. What happens is they say we are going to all respect that whole open door treaty. Remember, with China. That's just the fact. We're not going to divide China up. None of us who signed this are going to divide China up. And make our own little policy. We're not going to do that. Now, Japan gets mad about it. Because who of all those nations I listed, other than China, you know, there, is close to China? Japan. And Japan is right there. And they are already moving into the area and extract the mineral resources they need for their industrial juggernaut. Okay? So when they see this being signed, they're saying to themselves, they're doing this to limit our natural, uh, our, our rights pro. Okay. So that's going to be taken <coughs> as a, a hit again. Uh, uh, is it not that they don't think they don't think they don't think Now, other attempts would be made during this time period to, to keep the peace. Uh, the World Court would be created. It was urged, the creation of this entity was urged by the Hague Conferences of uh, 1899 and 
The United States would never join it. We would never join it uh, on the ground that we do not like the whole concept of an uh, international uh, jury being able to tell the United States that we were wrong and then possibly having to, to uh, abide by it. It would later morph into the United Nations Court of Justice after World War II. But one of the most humorous things that comes out about uh, during this time period and this, these attempts to pursue peace is what is known as the Kellogg Treaty or the Pact of Paris. Both uh, are, are good names. Basically, what happens is uh, major European nations come together in Paris and they decide that the best way to make war, uh, to prevent war from occurring, was to make it illegal. Okay? We're going to make war illegal. So, therefore, we are equipping, we are equating war with being bad. It's war bad. Or it's bad. Or it's bad. Because it's bad, it's illegal. And because it is bad, it is legal. You should not do. You should not do illegal, right? Correct. Okay. Because it is bad, it is legal. Because it is legal, you should not do. Right? How many of you drove here today? How many of you may have gone over the speed limit by just a fraction of a of a mile per hour? All of you have done something illegal. All of you have done something bad, and you should be ashamed of that. <laughs> You should all be ashamed for violating the law of the speed limit and breaking the law. Because you broke the law, you are bad. Because you are bad, you should be punished, right? Now, how would you be punished for speeding? Police officer pulls you over and gives you a ticket. That is the consequence for your speed, correct? Okay? So this... This is what happens. If something is made illegal, there has to be ramification. Correct? Okay. You know. The Paris, the, the Pact of Paris does not establish a punishment for somebody violent. There is no enforcement mechanism. If the police did not control Highway 6, that is the way you came here today. Would you speed? Yes. You'd be going like 120 miles an hour. Not in my car, it's by a park. <laughs> it gets to 80 and the whole thing starts shit. no repercussions for declaring war, because there's no repercussions for declaring war, there's nothing that's going to prevent you from actually declaring Now, let's talk about some domestic problems. During World War One, during World War One, prior to World War One, Russia was the breadbasket of the United uh, of the world. The breadbasket of the world. What does that mean? Something is the breadbasket of the world. What does that mean? What? No, not the economic system. That that was London. Prior to Russia, you're the breadbasket. You, you fed the rest of the world. This is where the world's grain supply is. This is where wheat came from. Okay? All of that comes from here. And here's the problem. This may sound kind of similar to something you may have heard recently in uh, the news. Okay? In order for Russia to ship things to Europe, where does it have to come from? 
And the map of Russia really hasn't changed much since this one. Where does it have to come from? Pink area. Where does it come from? What's an area that's been in the news associated with Russia in the last three years? Where? Ukraine. Ukraine is right here. Okay. And Ukraine, part of the Soviet Union, but it falls uh, it falls away, it breaks away in 1991, the Soviet Union falls. However, the Black Sea is the only warm water port Russia has. Okay? Then and today. In order for them to ship anything by water, by sea, to Europe, it has to go to the Black Sea. Okay? That is why uh, Korea, uh, the Korean Peninsula, uh, Korea right now is such a hot topic. Russia wants it. Because if that's denied to them, their economy will suffer. Then their economy is, is, is built off by corruption right now. But uh, it, it, would, it would be very detrimental to their economy. But in order to get through the Black Sea, into the Mediterranean, they have to go to the two areas that are uh, easily controlled, Bosphorus Strait and the Dardanelles, both of which were controlled by the Ottoman Empire during this time period. So when the Ottoman Empire goes to war, they're on the side of who? <coughs> Central powers. When they're with the Central powers, that is Austria and Germany, against France, England, and Russia. As a result, they say, no, 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 no. Russia cannot ship through the Dardanelles to the Bosphorus Straits. As a result, who steps in? that They can't ship their, their grain. As a result, who steps into the void created because of the situation? The United States. And we start producing all of this grain. In fact, to help things out, the United States says uh, a bushel of wheat is going for $1.25. Make sure that we get enough wheat, we're going to pay farmers $2.50. So double, your, double your income. Who would like to double their income right now? Okay, don't do anything different. Doubling your income. Sounds good, right? Okay. Now here's the thing. You're a farmer. Farmers never had money. Never had money. They bartered, they traded, uh, they they bought credit. They never had money. So they really money is not something very understandable. So all of a sudden, the government says, I'm going to double the amount of money you have available, uh, that we're going, to, we're going to double the amount you get paid by a uh, bushel of people. Okay? If you had, you were meeting your basic necessity, what's the difference between a need and a want? So a need something you have to have to survive, to survive. Yeah. I always had a hard time when I was your age because I always thought I needed a huge car stereo. Yeah. That, that's a want. These are how. Okay. So if you have everything that you need, and all of it, and you're making ends meet, then all of a sudden you get double income. What happens? What we go get what you want, right? Okay. And guess what? One of the things that you might want is this new highfalutin thing that's the ugliest green you've ever seen. But it's a John Deere track. Now, what, what does that happen? What? More production. Prior to World War One, prior to really the the, the, the invention of uh, uh, the, the tractor, it took one man about fifty four work hours to uh, plant, cultivate, and harvest one acre of land. Okay, one acre. When the tractor comes in, 
four out. Four out. So all of a sudden, you've got more time on your hand. You've got more time on your hand. You've got more money coming in. What are you going to do? Buy more land. Because if you buy more land, you can plant more crops. And if you plant more crops, what do you do? Make more money because that John Deere tractor is just going, bought it on credit. Paying it off, but get you bought the land on credit, you're paying it off. But the money is so good, what? Buy another track. Because you're just making money and over this. And then 11th hour, the 11th day, 11th month, come. Armistice. War's over. Government says, no more $2.50. Now it's going to be with the market. The market will take. Okay? So when supply, demand was up there, and supply was right there, doing good. Guess what? Demand goes down. And it's not that quick. It's over time. But as it goes over time, you know, once once the Ottoman Empire is defeated, Russia can can shift their wheat again. And for about six or seven years, the uh, battlefields that were just devastated were unusable in Europe. But after about five or six years, they returned to being able to be uh, uh, tilled, and Europe is able to feed itself. Problem though is that the United States never stops producing at this level. Because we don't stop producing at this level, what happens? Nobody buys that wheat. And when that wheat price starts to drop, farmers find themselves having to plant double to make the same amount of money, okay? If it goes from two dollars and fifty cents to a dollar twenty-five, how do you get back up to fifty? Double, right? Okay, is that helping anything? No, because you're glutting the market. Demand is still down, but the supply is going straight to the roof. They find themselves so in debt that they can't cut back, and they're doing everything they can to try to survive. In an attempt to try to help them out, Congress is going to pass the emergency tariff of 1921. And it was aimed at helping farmers by placing a tariff on cotton, wheat, and other grain. Okay, so people wouldn't buy foreign cotton, wheat, and other grain. Do we import cotton, wheat, other grain? No. You ever driven through Kansas? Have you? What do you see? Miles and miles and miles and miles of cotton. Cotton. Corn. Corn and wheat. Always love driving through a uh, bottle here. Brad's Brad's bottle, like go to like summer when it's cotton season. Because as far as you can see, it's hot. Every. They passed the tariff on something we didn't need. Now, uh, to another attempt in 1923 uh, was the Federal Intermediate Credit Act. And what this did is it provided intermediate loans to farmers so they wouldn't lose their land and they wouldn't lose their home. Nineteen twenty two, the Capital Volstead Act is added, which encouraged and provided money for farmers to create cooperatives. Remember how that worked out last time? It worked out for it. Get things cheaper. And then in nineteen twenty four, the McNary Hagen bill. This allowed this this called for the purchase of surplus crops and grains. 
try to get them off the market. What's the problem there, though? What? Well, it's going to be wasted, yeah, but what's the, what's the problem? Is that the root of the problem? No. That's the end result of the problem, is that there's too much on the market. The root of the problem is that farmers are producing too much. It doesn't address that. Now, why do I tell you that? Well, I tell you that because that is going to be important in just a few moments. Right now, not so much, but in a few moments, yes. This brings us to the election of 1928. The election of 1928, because the economy is fantastic, you are going to see the Republicans nominate uh, Herbert Hoover, who was Calvin Coolidge's Secretary of Commerce. Hey, what does the Secretary of Commerce do? What is commerce? If you can just describe it in one word, business. Commerce is business. The economy is great. So much money that you know, this is the era of Great Gatsby. You saw the Gatsby movie, Great Gatsby movie that came out last year. You see all this opulence and wealth just, just exuding from everything. That's what that that's not really an over uh, uh, an overgeneralization. That's kind of how it really was. If you are going to be choosing a candidate president, wouldn't you choose a guy whose job was overseeing the United States business? The businesses? Sure, why not? If everything's going great, yeah. You know, you're living for today, not for tomorrow. Woo-hoo. Now, because of his past, Hoover's past, as Secretary of Commerce, he was known as the great engineer because he had helped engineer this great economy that we have. Democrats are going to nominate out the ECM. I want you to watch something here. This is rather important. This right here is the election of 1924. What do you see? You see the, you see, uh, the Solid South, correct? Yes? Solid South? All Democrats want those evil Republicans. What happened? 1928. What changed? Texas and Florida broke and didn't vote Republican. I mean, they vote Democrat, they voted Republican. Why? What? No. Well, we are. <laughs> not, not big business. And I promise you, after this election, they go back and vote Democrat. Yes. No. Ah, they didn't like Smith. Why? What was it about Smith that made him, <coughs> him not accept candidate for president? What do you think? Last class has some really good interest. What do you think? See if you can outguess it. Something about him they did not like. What? Wasn't he a good speaker? No. He wasn't ugly. <laughs> <laughs> I told my ass in the last class was gay. No. Okay. No, 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 he didn't. No, had nothing to do with segregation. He's not good with it. No. Because of this one character flaw, they were they refused to vote for him. No. He was Catholic. He was Catholic. How many Catholic presidents have we had? One. Who was it? JFK. What is different about Catholicism than the Protestant denominations of Christianity? Who in here is Catholic? Admit it. Come on. Who in here is Catholic? Catholic. Okay, what? What? What is different about Catholicism? About the Well, Aren't they more like spiritual and stuff? That Protestant, they're more like. I think they're not angels, saints. 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 Yeah. And the Protestants are more straightforward. Like, like um. The See, Catholic- I'm a Baptist. I got a direct line to God. 
Okay. <laughs> Catholics don't. Yeah, it's a long to, distance call. It's got to go through where? Uh, where's yeah. that to go through? Where? No. Rome. It's got to go through Rome because there's a dude there and his name is the uh, Pope. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> In the Catholic's life, in the religious life, the Pope is the highest representation of their religion on earth. Yes? Okay? Catholics say yes? Okay? As a Baptist, I call God up directly. Okay? No? And so what happens is there is a fear that if Smith became president, Pope would call him up and say, I need you to do this, and he would say, yes, sir, I will, because I am a good Catholic. Okay? It is a real fear at this time. When we get into the 60s, JFK is talking to this huge group of Houston Baptist ministers, and they say, if you want our vote, you have to give us a letter saying you will not answer to the Vatican, and you will answer to the American people. And he says, I'll do that if I get your vote. He says, I would like to see that. And he does. He writes a letter, says that I answer to Derek, not, not Vatican. Only one president has one So Hoover wins. The first thing he does is he turns to fulfilling his campaign promise of helping out the farmers. And the first thing he does is getting it, uh, is the uh, passage of the Agricultural Marketing Act. Like, this sets up a federal farm board, and this federal farm board is given $500 million to set aside to aid farmers that need. In addition, again, they were given the authority to buy up surplus uh, crops. Again, it doesn't deal with true problems, dealing with the what we're dealing with, that it is what that we're using. Trying to help out farmers, again, we pass another tariff. This is the Holly Smoot Tariff. Holly Smoot Tariff, 1931. Sometimes these representative senators think he's together, he's really put their names together and see it. Which order they should go in. Might be I used to, I used to have to be very careful when I was teaching the federal government because at the time period the majority leader of the House of Representatives named Dick Army and the Senate minority leader named Harry Reid. <laughs> All problematic. The Holly Smooth Tariff is going to set uh, going to try to aid farmers by establishing tariffs on things of the import that's what they do. But it sets them on things that farmers don't buy. This tariff is the highest tariff on record in some instances. <coughs> but it set things like like tariffs on like iron imported iron, imported steel. Stuff that we don't really import. And what would happen as a result, because it is so high, any of the any of the nations that were hoping to sell their goods with us that fell under the tariff are hit so hard that we're not gonna buy their 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 thing. When we don't buy their merchandise, it just further compounds the problem. During this time period, we would try to rectify some of the wrongs that had occurred in the Latin American uh, nation. Uh, prior to Bush's administration, first uh, is the Thompson Eurasia uh, Treaty of 1921. Here, this is a treaty with Colombia. In the late 19 a vast oil deposit is discovered on ground owned by Colombia. American nations tried to 
drill in these areas and get permission to drill in these areas, but for some reason, Colombia wasn't very interested in dealing with it. I wonder why. Joe, you think you know why? Yes? Why aren't they dealing with it? Why aren't they willing to deal with it? We took Panama, that's right. We tried to negotiate a deal with them in regards to Panama, the Panama Canal. What happened when we get the get, uh, deal we wanted? We encouraged the Panamanians to revolt, and then when they rebelled, prevented Colombia from putting down the insurrection by having the USS Nashville there ready to blow out uh, any uh, Colombian troops uh, that tried to land. So to try to smooth things over with them, we passed this uh, thompson Eurasia Treaty of 1921, in which we uh, asked for forgiveness from Colombia and gave them $25 million. So here's a $25 million to let us drill on the land. They said, okay, we're friends again. Now you will remember the Roosevelt Corollary. Roosevelt Corollary stated that if a Latin American nation is not behaving, United States would um, send in military troops to encourage behavior that the United States likes. This would be something that uh, kind of had unintended consequences. Uh, we would end up uh, being, uh, if we were going to Nicaragua, we would be in Panama. Again, in Cuba, go into Haiti, the Dominican Republic, be involved with the Virgin Islands. All of these are areas that we would go into occupy to make sure people of uh, those Latin American nations were behaving the way we wanted them to. Now, uh, I don't know about you, but the number one way to get me to not behave is to have armed men come and force me to try to force me to do something I don't want to do. That might, I might buy lip service and say, yes, yes, I will, but that doesn't mean I'm going to work to accomplish those things. So we would begin withdrawing from the, uh, the Caribbean. We would repudiate Roosevelt for Larry and say, no, we're not going to do that anymore. That's not our business. We're going to withdraw from the area, the Caribbean. Now something that Hoover did not have a problem with doing was recognizing government that may had come, that, uh, may had come into power through violent means. Remember, Puerto had come into power in Mexico assassination. And those records, as a result, uh, it's not going to be until 19, uh, the 1930s and uh, the administration that it, they actually get recognized as an official government. who says, you guys are in power? That's cool. This brings us to the Great Depression, the onset of the Great Depression. And what happens here, there's, there's a story, probably apocryphal, but it's, it's, Joe Kennedy is uh, JFK's dad, and he is a big time wheeler and dealer in New York. A lot of stock, a lot of everything. Is a bootlegger, runs illegal booths. And Joe Kennedy is one day walking up to his office. A uh, boy shines shoes outside his uh, outside his building. Says, "Hey, Mister, you want your shoes shined?" And Kennedy looks down and says, "Yeah, I need my shoes shined." Yeah. So he sits down and lets the boy start shining his shoes. He's reading the Wall Street Journal, and as he's reading the Wall Street Journal, the boy says something. Down and says, Excuse me, what? What did you say? And the boy says, "Mister, you want a stock tip?" Joe Kennedy, the wheeler, dealer, stock market. What was this kid about? Stock. He says, why would you know anything about stock? Why should I listen to you? The kid says, well, I, Mr. I own stock. I own lots of stock. And he says, you, a little boy, own stock? Yeah, everybody owns stock. Joe Kennedy realized that's a problem. He realized the market was saturated. There were too many people invested in the stock market. And that day, when sold all his stocks. Completely invested himself in any all the stock took his fortune and invested in this place that was starting up out in uh, Los Angeles called 
Holly. At the time, there were 90 million people in the United States. 15 million of those 90 million people were invested in the stock market. Because times were so good, you could invest $100 in the stock market and within a couple of days sell it for $1,000. Right? $100 and $100 share could be $1,000 in a couple of days. That's how it's good. Now, the exact same situation that happened to the farmer is going to happen to the people who are investing in the stock market, except here it's called speculation. And what happened is people would invest their money in the stock. They'd say, here, what $100 a stock is, they would, that stock would increase in price. Now, they don't want to sell that stock, they want to buy more stock. So what they do is they go to the bank, and they go to the bank, the bank says, uh, what are you going to give us for this loan? You know, I want a loan. They said, what am I going to give us for, what are you going to give us for this loan? That is called what? Put some gap. Called, called collateral. Bank gets it, if you can pay back your loan. Okay. So what they actually allowed you to do, so let's say you, are, I'm drawing a board lunch there. So. What you are allowed to do is you own stock, okay? What you could do is you could go to the bank and put down that this is the amount of money I have on this, this is my collateral, uh, this amount of stock, okay? And then what you would do is you go to, the, then once you got that money, you go to the stock market and you would uh, buy more stock, which would generate more money for your stocks, and then what, what's, more, what's happening? Continue the process. What's happening? It's the same money, but if you're artificially inflating but guess what's going to happen when this becomes if this was to become worth zero, the stock market is go, the bank is going to say, "Where's our money?" And you're going to say, "Well, I don't have it. I put collateral down. My collateral is worth zero. I don't actually have it physical you know, cash." And you built a house of cards, and it's all going to come crashing down. And it does it comes crashing down on Black Tuesday, October 29, 1959. The stock market in one day loses 30%. The equivalent of $30 billion a day. Now, nobody knows why it started. The first big sell-off occurred uh, a couple days beforehand, in which automotive stock was sold by, uh, I mean, was, was, was uh, sold off, a huge share of stock was sold off, but that's not really the reason, but kind of once it started, we started losing faith in the stock market and the steam and the weakness of the economy uh, you artificially inflate was real. There's a lot of reasons uh, that led to this. One was speculation, and the other one was more to real estate. Houses go houses were being built in Florida by the thousands. And as a result, we do have prime real estate. What happened? The price of that house is a lot higher than what it's really worth. You had that happen back in two thousand eight, two thousand six when the housing market went bust. Houses were being destroyed because they weren't worth but they were valuing Go, going in and bulldozing the houses because they would never be able to sell them that. They were writing off hundreds of thousands of dollars. So these houses were being built and they were being insured for way, mu way more than they were actually worth because Florida was so desirable. Then in 2006, a hurricane came. And this hurricane destroys around a billion dollars worth of equipment and homes, which meant insurance companies are going to have to pay for that, and they're going to go bankrupt. 
In addition to that, England, thinking they are still the, the uh, global economic leader, is going to try to shore up their economy by switching back to gold standards. The downside of that is their own weakness, their own uh, weakness in their economy is real, and it causes them to suffer more. So the stock market crash has occurred. Now what are the reasons? We talked about overproduction. We never addressed root cause of overproduction, be it the wartime widgets we talked about last time, or be it the... Uh, be it the, uh, the wheat that farmers are doubling up on so that they can try to get some of that money back, try to pay off their debts. Another problem is when you're overproduced, you're obviously under-consuming. We are not meeting the demands that are fat. We are, we are not purchasing at the demands that are fat. So, we are under-consuming. We are not... Uh, purchasing what the nation is creating. And then when the slightest hint of doubt occurs, the American people have a tremendous loss of confidence in their economic system. Now, I made a comment a few minutes ago which I said people were living today and for today and they were not worrying about tomorrow. What I meant is that they got the money, it came in, they knew more money was coming in later, so they spent what they had at that time and they did not save. They lived way beyond their means. Because they lived beyond their means, when it came time, they were publicly in debt. They, 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 they were hugely debt, and that debt could not be paid. And as a result, they're going to sell off everything they have, and many times they're going to lose their houses. To give you an example of kind of what I'm talking about, hopefully that will work. Got the video, I just don't it's good. Yeah. Don't look now, but there's something funny going on over there at the bank, George. I've never really seen one, but that's got they're on their way to the honeymoon, but that's his bank. Funds their needs. They will close up for a week when they. 
and reopened. It took over the bank. I may lose a fortune, but I am willing to guarantee your people to just tell them to bring their shares over here, and I will pay 50 cents on the dollar. Boy, you never miss a trick, do you, partner? Well, you're going to miss this one. If you close your doors before 6 p.m., you will never... Re George, was it a nice wedding? Gosh, I could be there. Yeah. Check this one. Yeah, his uncle's forgetful, so he ties strings around his finger to remember things. He got it to go to the wedding. But if you take that one off, the wedding's over. Uh, just remember, this thing isn't as black as it appears. Some news for you, folks. I was just talked to old man Potter and he guaranteed cash payments to the bank. The bank reopened next week. But, George, I've got my money here. Did he guarantee this way? Oh, Charlie, I didn't even ask him. We bought it over here. I'll take mine now. No, but you're, 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 you're thinking of this place all wrong as if I got the money back in a safe. But the money's not here. Well, your money's in Joe's house. That's right next to yours. And in the Kennedy house and Mrs. Maitland's house and a hundred of are you lending them the money bill, and they're going to pay it back to you as best they can? What are you going to do? Foreclose on I got two hundred forty two dollars. And two hundred forty two dollars is going to break anybody. Okay. All right. Here you are. You sign this. You get the money in 60 days. 60 days? Well, that's what you agreed. You bought your share. Tom, Tom. Get your money? No. Well, I did. Old man Potter will pay 50 cents on the dollar for every share you've got. <laughs> You can see what happened. That, that, that's a great example of bank. That's why I show it, because you can see this mentality that people get that they've got to go find money out of the bank while they're still there. Now, truthfully, money that you deposit in a bank is not the money you take out. That money is sent to give other people to build houses and add on to their business, existing business, what have you. That's what he's showing there. What you can see at the end 
is this fear that people have of banks. And there's, it's, uh, uh, it, it's, for the most part, it's uh, well-founded. In 1930, thir uh, 1,300 banks closed. In 1931, 2,400 would close. Now, so what? They closed. When they closed, any money you had in there was lost. It's not like today where you have the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation that guarantees your money up to, like, what, $150,000 per account. Uh, if that goes, that bank goes uh, out of business, you're still guaranteed that money. Here, if you lost it, it was gone. So my grandfather grew up during this time period, and he did not really like banks. In his house, when he built it, he had a special area that was built that had a, a false ceiling where he kept value. So that if somebody broke into it, they would not know to look there. I knew to look there because he showed it. But it was one of those things that, you know, you had to, to look to see and you wouldn't find it right away. Still, uh, you can see this fear that people have in regard to business and, and to, uh, to banks. Right? You also got to see the difference big bank buying up a little bank. Hey, I'm making you a deal, giving you 50% 50, 50 of what you're actually That's, we can still do that today. All right, we'll end there for the day. We'll see you guys later. Have a good week.